everyone, and welcome to another session of AP Human Geography with Mr. Elrod. And today we're going to continue on in Unit 7, discussing cities and urban land use. And today we're going to move on to a conversation about modern urban developments. Uh, and so some of the things that we're going to talk about and deal with some of the, the new movements and urban development and some new uh, landscape patterns that we're seeing in our urban spaces today. Uh, one of the new developments, and I, it's not, I wouldn't say it's necessarily new as in within the last couple of years or so, it's something that's becoming more prevalent, uh, especially as we talk about this idea of sustainable development and uh, the lack of desire for urban sprawl in certain parts of the country, and also certain parts of the world, is this idea of a green belt. Um, another term used for green belt is also what's called an urban growth boundary. Uh, so the idea of the green belt or the urban growth boundary is to try and contain the urban sprawl. And so uh, in the area that's directly under, uh, under the control of the, uh, of the central city in the urban area, uh, instead of trying to in or allowing for the development of less dense uh, development that surrounds the city, that is very much characteristic of places that ha have um, that have lots of sprawl like Atlanta or like Los Angeles, uh, you create this green belt or this urban growth boundary which basically says that any new development that pertains to or is zoned for, uh, that is zoned for uh, interaction with the, uh, with the urban center, uh, commercial, residential, uh, industrial, must uh, take place inside the green belt and so anything that exists outside of the green belt is going to have to be zoned agricultural and therefore uh, the, the development of that space is going to be much less. So of course the benefits of that is that you are able to contain the sprawl that happens, you're able to uh, keep you know, low, density, uh, low density development from taking place, you're able to contain some of the issues in regards to transportation, uh, resource uh, consumption and things along those lines and it also re re it forces the revitalization of certain parts of downtown areas uh, that maybe uh, in instead if there was no green belt uh, people would have gone outside the city but now that they have to make choices with inside the green belt they might choose to rather revitalize the area that's run down now this also could contribute potentially to the, uh, to the process of gentrification that we were discussing in our in our previous video, so it does create some issues there. Um, now, one of the other things that uh, one of the other things that the green belt does is a lot of times it actually causes an increase uh, in the prices of land because what happens is is with the green belt because no development is allowed outside of the green belt, um, the there, there is almost this, there's an artificial sense of land scarcity, and so with the land scarcity, uh, you're going to have an increase in the prices. And so we've seen some issues, some situations, especially in places like Portland, Oregon, where there's a green belt, uh, like San Francisco, like London. Um, there's issues with, uh, especially middle to lower income people having issues or having trouble staying in their location because of the desire to redevelop, increase in rent prices, increase in land prices. Um, so there is there is going to be that trade-off there. And here's a here's a map that I found of the urban growth boundary that exists around Portland. And so you see. Uh, you know, this red line is the idea that you're not allowed to create additional development outside of this red line. Now why there's this little exclave out here, I'm not exactly sure, uh, but if you'd like you can check into that and let me know. Uh, one, of the other, one of the other developments we're starting to see is in what we call street morphology, and this is the development of new street patterns. And this would be more for low density areas, uh, because what we're seeing is the development of a lot of these neighborhoods that are kind of uh, self-sustaining neighbors, I say self-sustaining, they're, they're kind of separate from everything else. Uh, and so you have the development of what's called the cul-de-sac. Uh, and the cul-de-sac is, is kind of the end point of the neighborhood. And uh, what the cul-de-sac does is it helps to create more privacy for the homeowners and the people inside the neighborhood. Uh, but what it does also do is it takes up a lot more space uh, but again, the people that live in the lower density areas, they want more space, they want more privacy uh, than they might otherwise have in some of those places. And it is going to replace the grid system that was traditionally used for neighborhoods, whether it's in urban spaces or in you know, some of the suburban spaces, as we'll see here in just a second. So it does allow for more privacy, uh, but one thing it does do is it also tends to create traffic problems because most of the time, uh, these neighborhoods are only going to have one entry point 
Uh, some neighborhoods might have two entry points, but everybody that's coming in has to go one way. Everybody that's leaving has to go the same way as well. And so uh, typically that creates congestion, creates difficulty getting out of the neighborhood, especially if it's on a busy road. And so you have to widen the road, you have to put in traffic lights, and so it just creates some additional hassles in terms of development. Uh, some interesting things to look at. This is actually the town uh, that my wife is from called Sumter, South Carolina. This is a suburb of the uh, of the city of Columbia, actually a, a relatively you know large uh, large city itself. Uh, but you'll notice this is this is the uh, the city, and this is a large neighborhood, and it's kind of this large continuous neighborhood. You have you know, here and then over here as well. There are kind of these larger neighborhoods, but you'll notice this grid system uh, that has been established, and you know it's relatively close to a lot of the things that that are there in Sumter and um, you can actually see some of the new cul-de-sac type developments over here but again over here in kind of the old town these a lot of these homes in the neighborhood were built in 1950s or so it's an old industrial town uh, that's been around since the 1800s uh, but you see you know how you're able to fit a lot of houses into this space so you're able to utilize space a lot more efficiently uh, the next picture this is actually a uh, this is actually a Google Maps image of the town that I teach in and where my students live Coming Georgia, and you can see uh, here actually is our high school right over here. But you see this low density development. What we're talking about here, uh, you have these cul-de-sacs. You know the neighborhoods here. You see, uh, you know you have these houses on the street, and there's really nothing around it. Um, and the same thing over here. But you know, this is very low density. Each house is sitting on a lot more property, uh, typically, and insulated from uh, insulated from the roads because that's what they're looking for. Uh, to get away from the high traffic of these roads that are out here. So you can see definite differences in, in the uses of space and land uh, and, and road patterns between uh, the suburb of Cumming and then the suburb of Sumter, South Carolina. And so this is pretty indicative of you know older towns, older, older cities, and then some of the newer spaces that are being developed. And then of course, uh, this, a lot of this applies to this idea of zoning laws. And of course, uh, specific places can uh, create zoning that they feel is going to be most conducive to the growth of their particular town. Uh, so zoning laws can be used to either prevent development or they can be used to allow development. And a lot of times zoning uh, is used to concentrate certain types of development within a particular area. So whether it's revolving around, uh, whether it's revolving around mode of transportation, uh, a specific uh, a general area within the community, uh, things like that. And just like we're talking about with the, the green belt, typically anything outside of the green belt would be zoned agricultural, which is reserved for lower density uh, agricultural work. Uh, so either you, it's an active agricultural farm or it's, uh, it's a passive farm or you're just not doing anything with it in terms of animals, but it won't allow for uh, commercialization, it won't allow for industrialization, it won't allow for larger residential developments either. Now within zoning laws you can also uh, allow for or prevent certain levels of density of housing whether it's single family housing or multifamily housing uh, and so sometimes communities will use this to control the types of people that can move into their communities and I say types of people meaning levels of income because typically lower level income individuals are not going to be homeowners and they're also going to be living in multifamily housing like apartments or townhomes or something along those lines. Some of the more uh, recent trends that we've uh, seen begin to develop, uh, what's called neo-urbanism or new urbanism. And you have this idea that's beginning to develop. It's, it's interesting because it's almost like we're reversing trend in the way that we want to develop our communities and our cities. So to try and get people away from the sprawl, they're trying to bring things back together and, and condense it. Uh, and actually go back to that idea of the smaller community maybe within the larger urban setting. So you have these planned communities that are developed, it's called a, also called a livable city, um, and the idea is that you can live, work, and entertain yourself all in the same space. Everything is within a relatively short distance. So not just, it is, all, it is about health concerns in terms of getting people to walk, also about environmental concerns, uh, people driving less, but a lot of it is also about trying to create a sense of community. And that's what we've been talking about in class is that uh, this new trend of urbanism is about, it's not necessarily about telling you about the jobs that are there, but it's about selling you a particular type of lifestyle, uh, a sense of community, a sense of neighborliness, 
um, uh, you know, a sense of, of a healthy, uh, healthy living style. Uh, you reduce the amount of private space, but you increase the amount of communal space. And that's really what they're selling with this idea of neo-urbanism. And again, one of the main things there is they're trying to decrease sprawl outside of the urban area. And we see some places like this around uh, the country, and I apologize for the fuzziness of the picture, but there's actually a community uh, that is inside of Atlanta called Glenwood Park, and it's, it is this uh, concept. They're trying to, so it's actually inside the perimeter of Atlanta, and this whole community is supposed to contain everything that people need. Again, it's the housing, it's the work, and it's also the entertainment. You also have the community space. You have this large park here. They also have a dog park. Uh, they also have community gardens and they have community composting that you can do. Uh, so again, it's creating a sense of communal feel. But it's inside the city of Atlanta. Uh, so it's, again, almost this idea of creating uh, cities or communities within the city to try and uh, decrease the amount of, of um, activity space that people are participating in. Another one that's probably one of my favorites is this idea, uh, or this, is this uh, place called Celebration City, Florida. Uh, which is actually a Disney property, and so it's pretty much the same thing. You have all the, you have all the amenities you need. You have the housing, you have the entertainment, you have the work uh, that is that exists nearby. Um, but again, it's, just, it's the same concept, same same idea. But now, what you see a celebration city is you actually have different, uh, you have education uh, for the for the kids as well. Whereas I don't think that Glenwood Park has a school. Celebration City has a school. You have Celebration School. And one of the things that we like to do every year in my class is we, like, we actually take a virtual field trip to Celebration City, look at that city, and actually walk, walk, walk around it using our little Google Man here. Uh, it's just something that I like to do. It's kind of fun. Uh, so that is all that we're going to have time for today, and is also the last video for the unit. So I hope you found that to be helpful. If you have any questions, leave those in the comment box below, and I hope to see you next time.